Welcome to Clean Cut Conversations, the podcast for exceptional Southern Black men. Join us as we delve into vital topics, including mental health, relationships, finance, self-care, and entrepreneurship. Welcome to Clean Cut Conversations, the podcast for exceptional Southern Black men. I'm your host, Josh Lubbock, with my co-host, Royce Massengill, baby. And today, we will be discussing four topics, creative pursuits and special effects and makeup, community support through Apex, and at the same time, entrepreneurship and jewelry, and the importance of multicultural engagement within your community. But today, we have a special guest, Mr. Marcus Lucas. You know, he's an entrepreneur himself. But you know what? I don't want to explain his story. Let's just go ahead and introduce him. Go ahead, man. What's up, Mr. Marcus? How you doing? How you doing? First of all, that name, Marcus, that sounds like one of them, you know, like, before you turn into the superhero, you got that, 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 you got that name first, you know what I'm saying? Marcus. Marcus Lucas. Dun, dun. Yeah. How's it going, brother? Doing great. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Real happy to be here. So Nice, nice. So let me ask you, do you have any like upcoming projects that you would like to uh, share with our audience members? Sure. Well, I have one movie that I'm working on right now uh, okay. that I'm filming, but I don't think they allow me to say the name of it just yet. Don't do that. And, don't do that. <laughs> and I have another one that will come out at the um, the end of the year. Well, the red carpet will be at the end of the year. They okay. may release it at the beginning of the following year to the public. But the red carpet, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name of that one yet, but I'm a little excited about it because... <laughs> It is, uh, it's the largest role that I've had in any film. And mm-hmm. so I'm excited about that. Um, and there's a little action to it. So, you know. Okay. Get into. All right. Get into do a little bit of action. And um, and also, uh, <laughs> I, I, I play a uh, Dominican in it and I have an accent the entire movie, which Spanish is my other language anyway. Nice. My mom was like, can you hold your accent that long? I was like, have you ever seen me at a club? Yeah. I was Come like, on. yes, I can. <laughs> so, so, so we need to bring you to the club. Yes. The Latin, the Latin club. I, I'm going to keep that in mind. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, so you said action. So, you, so you, got, you got some little fight scenes? You got some... You know what I mean? Um, I didn't do the fighting. I was a part of the chase scenes, and okay. I was shot at a few times. That's a bit. That's a bit, yeah. man. Yeah. Ain't nothing, like, ain't nothing like being shot at the movies, man. <laughs> Getting paid to get shot at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's different. So let me ask you something. Like, So how long have you been in the entertainment scene? Uh, I think I was dramatic when I was born. So, mm. oh, I like that. Response. So, uh, my mom says, you know, I came twelve days late. Okay. So okay. I'm, I I made an entrance into the world on my own time, gotcha. uh, <laughs> which is typical red carpet people. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just started performing. My goal as a kid mm-hmm. was to actually be in the circus. Because I love performance. I also have a background in gymnastics as well. I read about that. And so, like, that was my goal. That was my goal. In fact, if I was not here today, I would be at the circus school in Nashville. (laughs) And it was going to be my first day uh, going to circus school. Because I was like, you know what? Let's not let go of that dream. So I was still going to... um, to pursue that as well, and then I have a meeting with another circus organization uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. So that was the goal. And then from there, from being in the circus, it just snowballed into acting, singing, just anything that was entertainment related. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And so I've always been in that field of entertaining and making sure that people had a good time and yeah. just enjoying it. So you you you, were, you should click a thespian then too. Like I, I got a minor in stage performance. Oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so yeah, I was looking. I was like, okay, man, uh, this is what. So did you grow up like watching the Ringling Brothers and all that? Did you ever go there? I did. Yeah. I did. I did. I did that. And then what I did was in elementary school, I was the daredevil, and my teacher came to me and she was like, "Can you please stop?" Because she said the other kids are trying to do what you do. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And we had already had somebody had a concussion. There was two arms that were broken, a collarbone. <laughs> Yeah, what were you doing, man? I I would go to the circus, watch what they did, Mm -hmm. and we had a set of uneven bars. It was like a high, a middle, and a low, and they're in a row. And then across from that Mm -hmm. was the uh, monkey bars. So what I would do, I would climb up on the middle uneven bar, and I would jump from standing on top of it 
through the air, catch onto the monkey bars, swing, and then let go, and then catch onto the other side oh, yeah, yeah. of the monkey bars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had it. Yeah. But not everybody else Yeah, didn't. then yeah. I would do flips off of the uh, balance beam that they had at school, yeah. too. And she was just like, they're trying to copy you. I mm. need for you to stop. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was, he was uh, trending in school. Already. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was already a leader. <laughs> yeah, right. TikTok him. <laughs> I That's wish we had that crazy. back in the day, man. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. You, you, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We would have been big already. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So let me ask you, like, so we know a little bit about your background, but let me ask you, who has been the most inspirational person throughout your journey? Um, In different phases of my life, I've had different people who inspired me. Um, depending on what I was doing, and I've done a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. In the performance world, my number one inspiration has been Jackie Chan, just because no matter how old he gets, right, right. he still does the same stuff. Yeah. Now, if you ask Jackie, he'll say, well, I'm slowing down, or I don't quite do this trick anymore, but his level of um, being able to do physical activity yeah. and and fight and do his, his own stunts and whatnot... At that age, like yeah. it's it's yes. still what he does is incredible. So that's you know I, I don't I don't too much like you know become like a super fan mm -hmm. over too many celebrities. Once yeah. you're sitting in the room with me, and especially if I'm working with you, we're coworkers. Mm. But if Jackie Chan walked in the room, I might faint. I might pass out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's it's crazy because compared to Bruce Lee, you know Jackie mm -hmm. Chan, he almost allows you to beat up yourself. <laughs> he never I'm not I'm not yeah. I'm not saying That's that he he hits you straight on but yeah. he'll take a plate that you're eating and you're holding a plate and then hit it and you hit yourself yeah. and you realize it's like hold on he never struck me. Right. Like he's Yes. He like avoids but his offense was his defense. Yes. There you go. He uses whatever is available to him. Mhm. Mm it makes a weapon out of it. So um, this is kind of transitioning a little bit, but come, I'm going to bring it back around. I used to be a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And as things got crazy in school shootings used to happen, I used to have the same speech every first day of school. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't care how much beef we have. If mm -hmm. you don't like her, she don't like you. You don't like me. I don't like you. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes in this classroom, we are all one family. Yeah. I said, and we go Jackie Chan on them. And whatever is in this classroom... <laughs> I said, that becomes a weapon. <laughs> I said, and we gonna all get a lick in. Yeah, yeah. All right? I said, we all get a lick in. I said, that chair, that stapler, I said, your pencil, <laughs> I said, whatever you see, yeah. that's a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So. Yeah. So, okay, man. All right, Mr. Jackie Chan. <laughs> so, were there any, like, social or geographical factors within your journey that, you know, could have possibly hindered your success? Well, sure. So um, there were a couple of things. Number one, I live in Tennessee. And if I wanted to do music, mm -hmm. I'm in the right place. Okay. As far as acting goes, I can't say that it's a bad location, but growing up as a kid, this was not ideal. Right, da, 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 um, da. right, yes. right, right. So it's now it's getting there. Mm. Um, there's a movie scene. Almost all but one of the movies that I've done mm -hmm. have been here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> believe it or not. And so we're growing in that industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but back then, that was not the situation. So mm -hmm. my mom, I remember her, like, I used to be like, oh, is you, you're preventing me from, you know, living out my dreams or whatnot. But she just could not see herself putting me on a plane yeah. to go work in California or wherever it was that I wanted to go to. Um, I did travel acting, but I didn't do that until I was a teenager. Okay. And it was like a two week and this is it. Okay. You know, so yeah, yeah. it wasn't like, hey, we need you for like two months to film um this whole episode or whatever, or a movie for three months or whatever. Yeah. Um, so those were some of the factors that made it a little bit more difficult. So I just took what I could yeah. and I joined uh singing groups, sometimes okay. singing slash acting groups, and then I did, you know, the stage performances and yeah, whatnot. Yeah. And that gave me the practice that I needed and, you know, to be in front of an audience. Um, and then I transitioned later on into movies. Okay, let me ask you something. So being in the South mm -hmm. and being in Tennessee as a black actor, mm -hmm. was it difficult 
at times because some of the roles, like I've I've looked at some of the films. I mean, we're now oh, we're yeah. transitioning cowboys. And right. I'm not saying nothing's wrong with that. Yeah. Right. Because right. Idris Elba, you know, he he was a concrete cowboy, you know, I saw that. But like, did you find any interest in any roles that was presented towards you because or presented to you, excuse me, because when you went to California, you're in a more diverse mm-hmm. uh <clears throat> location. So you have different topics, different assessments, different mm-hmm. realities, different perspectives. But when you're here, do you feel like everything is kind of closed-minded? Typecast. So yes, I remember, yes or no. Um, I, I can say that, well, let me just go ahead and say yes. But, <laughs> but I remember there was one time I got a role. Mm-hmm. I was so excited. I killed that audition. I mean, I killed that audition. Yeah. And I, it was Winnie the Pooh. Mm. And it was, I was, I was, I don't know, maybe nine years old, nine or 10 years old. Yeah. I got the role. Mm. And as, T- and as uh, not Tigger, um, oh, the mule, I forget his name. Eeyore? Eeyore. E- yes, okay. Eeyore. I got the role as Eeyore. Yeah. My mom would not let me have that because oh, yeah. she said, she said, in too many films and movies, black people have play like lazy, slow talking Mm -hmm. roles. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I I know you did good in the audition. She Mm -hmm. said, but I'm taking you out and I will not allow you to have that. Now, another time I did get a good principal role. I was going to be the prince in Cinderella, but I got a B in math. And my mom's a math teacher. She was Mm -hmm. like, you need an A. So (laughs) so she would not let me have that role because I got a B. And she was like, you got to get up to an A. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did Grease, and what was crazy was when I did Grease, that was like the first time that people really, really recognized me as an actor. Gotcha. Uh, I was in high school, I was a sophomore, and I had never had so much attention from the females that I wanted attention from Right, right. right. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and all my life. And I played an Italian, mm-hmm. which... Um, it's not black, but it's still kind of a minority role. It is. And yeah. so that just opened up a lot of doors for me. And I remember the director, she told me, she said, I would have made you the lead role. Mm-hmm. She said, but she said, if I would have made you the lead role, the opposite lead role was a female and she was white. And mm-hmm. she said, mm-hmm. I don't know if this community is ready for that. And she just went ahead and point blank told me, she said, but I want you to know mm-hmm. that you're good enough. Right, right, right. For me, that had way more singing roles. I was completely fine. Right, right, right. <laughs> I was right, just right, like, right. I had my f- couple of songs and I was good. Yeah. But um, I had enough of, um, I had enough stage time that people got to see me act, act. Okay. Um, but now, so. see, that would have turned into a Bronx <clears throat> tale. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Literally. Yes. Th- just opposite. Mm. Like, yes. she was a, a white woman and you were a black Italian. Yes. It, that's, you, yeah, that's interesting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Years later, they come out with the Bronx Tale. So you could have been yeah. that lead role. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could have been that lead role. <laughs> See, this is what in the early 90s. That was that was in mid-90s. the mid 90s. That was 1997. Okay. That was 1997. So I think mm-hmm. that at that time I could have, but mm-hmm. she was the same age as my parents. Yeah. And she grew up during the civil rights. Mm-hmm. And I think she just was like. Mm-hmm. I don't know where we stand. Yeah. She was fine. Yeah. Still has a little residue yeah. of that PTSD, you it know, is. has it he, worn off, you know? Right. Even though yeah. the movie, Bronx Tale, came out in 1993. So yeah. he could have played that role. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you yeah. could have played that role. I could have played that role. Exactly. Yeah. Broke some barriers because <laughs> that's what we're doing today. So besides that, man, let's talk about like your, your creative entrepreneurship overall. We know that you're in the entertainment industry, mm-hmm. but you're also. Mark the jeweler. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, <laughs> what inspired you to start a jewelry business, and how does your artistic background influence your designs? Sure. Well, one of my um, a lady that I knew, she was a mentor that I used to have uh, a few years ago, and she's in the country music industry. Okay. And what she always taught us was that you need to be an entrepreneur first, because she said a lot of people get so caught up in the, the oh, I want to be an actor, I want to be a star, I want to be a singer, whatever, that they forget that at the end of the day, it's a business. Mm-hmm. You are the product. Exactly. Okay. 
And so people get frustrated <clears throat> when they get to Hollywood or they get to um, the country music stages or whatever, and then they start figuring out, oh, I feel like I'm being used. Yes, you're the product. Mm. You're right. Your gift, your talent. Yeah. So you have to be an entrepreneur first. When I did my first movie, I was um, sitting on the, the, the set and I'm with some different um, celebrities and some different stars. Mm -hmm. And when we are in between scenes, all of them are on the cell phone, their cell phones, calling their other businesses, checking up on how the business is going. Okay. So right here, and it's crazy, huh. man. I don't <clears throat> want to cut you off, but mm -hmm. it's saying that. And do you agree with this? Mm -hmm. Global jury in the market of global jury is projected to reach about four hundred. An eighty point five billion dollars by twenty twenty five, with a growing interest in handcrafted and unique pieces like yours. Yes. So you, so you actually seen your business scale from when you first started it to now. Yes. So what I started off doing was my my heritage is we're Black Indians, you know, amongst nice. other stuff. Okay. So Eastern Banda Cherokee people, by way of <clears throat> Panama. Okay. So I started off making strictly traditional jewelry. Okay. And then my mother was like, she was like, I love everything that you're making for me. And she said, but I can't just go all garbed out at work. Gotcha. So what I did was I said, well, we're black Indians. So let me mix in some bling. So I started something called black Indian bling. So it may have bones, but have a little bling mixed in with it. Nice. Um, and just kind of mix uh -huh. things up. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's what she started wearing and people started catching on. We're mm -hmm. during 2020. I was just making jewelry and posting it on my social media. Right. And when I started doing that, I started making as much money as I was as a teacher. Hmm. And I was just like, uh, mm. Did you promote it in the classroom? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I wore my stuff hey. and I did have students who used to buy pieces off of me. Yeah. But the thing was, at that point, I was no longer a full-time teacher. Yeah, mm. yeah. I was just sitting at home. I think I was like maybe one semester out from teaching full-time. Mm -hmm. Nice. And when I started seeing my paycheck was matching up, mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. I started diving into different things. And I went um, on a, uh, a vacation um, in 2020, which, I mean, I know people frowned on, but I still did it. And <laughs> no, Don't worry. Don't worry. You wore a mask. I wore a mask. mask. I wore a mask. <laughs> Several of them. And mm. so, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and so I went. I went out to. Uh, I went out to Gatlinburg, and while I was on vacation, I met another gentleman who was uh, indigenous as well, okay. and um, had no idea that his family was the one that started the GIA, uh, which are the people who are the world's most leading authority on gemstones. Period. Okay. Oh, and so anytime that you that. get a diamond that says it's been GIA certified. You get the paperwork. That's, that's the organization. Okay. They are very, very the, the authority mm -hmm. you know, over any diamonds. They, they. Anytime you go to the museum, the um, anything that you see in the Smithsonian, they are the ones that have said this is real. This is what it is. This is its value. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. His family was the one. I didn't know that at first. Yeah. I became a customer, and we became good friends. And he said, "You're going to be my my business partner. You're going to be." Uh, the person that is over uh, helping me. I was like, oh, I am? He said, yes. I was like, oh, well, that I am. I will be. Yeah, yeah. So that gave me an opportunity because of his connections um, to be able to do that, to now have access to 55,000 plus stones all over the world. Mm. I can get anything, cut any size, mm. as long as we can get the raw material. Um, and so that's what I do. And it opened up new doors. And he liked the fact that I had black Indian bling because his family, he was fourth generation. He's like, I've never seen anything like that. And I am Native American. Mm -hmm. And he was like, but to add the black to it, he said, and I see jewelry all the time, but nobody does it the way that you do it. Mm -hmm. And so, and I almost, this is, this is. And that's what you're word. wearing right now. Eh? Yes. This is, all of these beads oh, are, uh, beats that he cut himself <clears throat> and then this is an emerald from Colombia and I said I don't want anything but a hole drilled through it yeah so it's just straight from the earth and I made a beat out of it and oh, then made impressive. this piece and then oh. these diamonds that I have on are pieces diamonds that he cut 
Mm. Oh, uh, Diamonds yeah. are forever. Diamonds yeah. are forever. forever. Yeah. 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 Wow. Like, be that yeah. Be up, man. I know. I like, yeah. I like that float on Black Indian Bling. Oh yeah. Black Indian Bling. Mm. But that's I nice. do. I do want to say this to anybody that's out there that thinks that your gift is too small. I almost did not show him my yeah. work because I didn't think that my work could compare to his. Mm. Right. Because he's dealing with like real diamond, like real yes. high price. Diamonds, yes, and to me, that's crazy because nowadays it's all about being simple mm. and unique, but yet it's all about being frugal and unique. Unique is the part. So, when you talk about where the jewelry industry is going, it's going to go there, but it's not going to go there the traditional way that it's always been done. So, yeah, yeah. like, so what about marriage? You still going to be the same rings, or yeah? So, people, so well, here's the beautiful thing. Okay. Diamonds are traditional. Okay. You're always going to have your traditional audience. Mm-hmm. But some of the rings that we have done, one of the most beautiful rings that we have ever done, to me, has, uh, I think that centerpiece was a six or seven carat. Um, the center stone was a sapphire. Okay. What? A beautiful, beautiful ring. Yeah. And then instead of diamonds... She put um we had she had white topaz put on the side, which mm-hmm. mimics a diamond, yeah. but doesn't have as much rainbow, but it's still blingy and shiny and it's clear. Yeah, yeah. Mm, right. And she did that because she's Jewish. Okay. Mm. So she wanted the blue and the white. Yeah. Gotcha. So I'm starting to get these brides that they want things that are unique and different and out of the box, Mm -hmm. which means that for some grooms, you may not always be paying diamond prices. You may be paying something else that may be a little bit cheaper. Right. Um, But yeah. But I'm glad, but you know, what what, what came to my attention when you're talking about the uniqueness of the the traditional way, and if we're speaking like on the black side, right? You said, you know, black Indian bling. Most, Most black bling, you know, in the last 20, 30 years have just been... Just studded out with just ridiculous amount of diamonds were real to me didn't have a cultural value. Like it was really just like, okay, we're just buying it from the cat in Houston with the gold grills. We just got right. but there was no like what you're doing has a cultural and 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 historical kind of value to it based off of being natives, being indigenous, instead of just putting on like T Pain, like like a big ass chain. Well, he's been he's just bringing that cultural essence back to it. Right, right, right. Instead right. of yeah. the the traditional, I'm just gonna get diamonds, but no, yeah, but what right. does that mean? Because it's like I'm yeah. like, okay, it's like going to a Mexican restaurant almost. Like when I go yeah. there, I feel the Mexican essence. Culture. Yeah, the culture <laughs> when I go there. Chinese, same way. You yeah, see yeah. the dragons, you see that. He's just saying, look, I'm in the diamond world and I'm introducing you to my black Indian side, black mm-hmm. American and Indian, mm-hmm. Native American. Right, right, right. 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 So with that, to me, it's like, let me ask you. So most of your customers. Are they minorities or are they white? We have everything. We get everything. And the beautiful part about doing custom work is when you talk to somebody and you interview them, you get to see what means something to them. Okay. And every culture is a little bit different. Like I have one lady, she buys cut stones from me, but she also has an appreciation Mm -hmm. like me for just the rough. So she may buy a cut diamond, and then she may just buy a diamond off me that just came straight out of the mine, straight mm-hmm. off from the earth. Yeah. And she just wants to wrap it in some wire or some gold or some something like that. She does yeah, yeah. all she wants. Right. And so it, that that brings that aspect of it as well. Different people um, have an appreciation for different things. Gotcha. Um, every culture is a little bit different. And I always have people who ask me, well, can I get a stone that's going to heal me? I'm like, ma'am, I, I deal with all cultures. I, I don't know what you think is important. Yeah. What right. color would you like? <laughs> oh, right, right, right. right. <laughs> I mean, let's start it off with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you just tell me whatever it means to you. And this one lady, she was just like, she came and she wanted rose quartz because her dad died and that was supposed to heal her. Mm. I said, ma'am, you're going to be really pissed with me if you walk out this 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 meeting sad and upset. I said, when was your dad born? And he said, November. I said, okay. Citrine that'll make you always remember him because that's his birthstone. Now, what's mine? I'm May, May 30th. Emerald. I'm an emerald. Emerald. Yeah. yeah what's about October? I think I'm an opal or something, right? I'm what? October. Opals. You a yeah. Libra? Uh, no, Scorpio. Yeah. How, what's your birthday? October 27th. 
Well, it's 20 seconds. It's okay. We're still October. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what being a Scorpio means, but okay. <laughs> I, just know, I know my birth though. Yeah. <laughs> got you. Got you. Got you. Dope. Um. So let me, let's 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 move on from that because obviously there's a ton of questions I could ask you okay. about your sure. jewelry business, but <laughs> sure. let's talk about the art of special effects. Sure. Okay. This is this plays a big part in your life. So let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. How has your journey in special effects makeup influenced your ability to connect with people? And what makes this art form unique in your interactions? Because according to a 2023 survey, 60% of people have watched special effects makeup in mm-hmm. action through media, but only 15% have seen it live. Okay, so this is what I do. Okay. So when I started special effects makeup, um, I started it from church because we used to do this big production every year and it was angels and demons fighting and I played a demon and mm-hmm. I would watch what they did to me. Right. I also played a pig at another one and they when I tell you they t- they made me look like a pig, I can move my snout and everything. Oh wow. Oh wow. Um and they were all people who had a background in the arts. And so these were people who really could have been, should have been Mm -hmm. in in professional industries, but they just happened to be at church. And so that's where I learned. So what I did was I started practicing on my kindergartners (laughs) when I was a teacher, because if I messed up, they weren't going to care. Right, (laughs) right, right, right. And so then once I did that, I started learning the scarring and I started getting people ask me, could they pay? Because... Mm -hmm. Here, we have a lot of people in music. Mm -hmm. We have a lot. There there, there was a growing number of actors and actresses, Mm -hmm. but there were not a lot of people in the special effects arena. And so I was like, this is a way that I can make myself stand out. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually got me into the movie industry. But how do I connect with people with that? So obviously, if you can see, if if you're watching this, um, you can see that I have a multiple skin colors. And as I told you, I, I am uh, multiracial, which I have a weird uh, skin condition where uh, even though I'm multi-racist, the, the colors didn't mix. Mm-hmm. And so they kind of separate. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. No. <laughs> I mean, that's a good way of putting no, it. I, I, mean, tell, <laughs> I tell people that all the time. Yeah. No, it's vitiligo. It's okay, vitiligo. vitiligo. Okay. <laughs> so, so, but what I do is I got it because my best friend passed away and I really didn't deal with the grief. Mm. And so when you you don't deal with the grief, the stress that's in your body is going to come out some way or another. And that's just mm-hmm. how mine came out. So now I go and I do live presentations and I'll do special effects makeup and I'll make a wound on someone. Yeah. And I'll talk about uh, what happened to this wound and if this was real, how would you treat it? And if you didn't treat it, what would happen? And people always give a story and we make up a story with the audience, audience participation, Mm -hmm. and then we move into emotional scars Mm -hmm. and talk about what happens if you don't take care of yourself. And then I give my testimony and my story. Mm -hmm. And so that has, I've done it, you know, it's been filmed. I've gone places, prisons, jails, um, all kinds of places. And I do it with my students usually once a year. Uh, when I was teaching, uh, and that's also how I taught my colors to my students as well, was mm-hmm. through the makeup colors. And then I would give my story at the same time. So it's it's been a very, very, very uh, powerful part of my journey in connecting with people. They never, ever, ever forget it mm-hmm. because it's so visual. See, and that's, uh, if that's, that's like a, okay. So special effects, first of all, Special effects, my mm-hmm. makeup people at the original filters, ladies and gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? Those are the originators. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But on uh when it when it comes to that, like uh how with every with new technology and movies and stuff now where they're using like CGI for, you know, different monsters or beings and stuff, you know, back in the eighties, like, you know, it, the makeup artists were were really appreciated then. And those people look real from zombies, from thriller and all that mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like do you still see that as, you know, being a makeup artist, is that like, you feel like it's more, uh, still appreciated now that all this other technology can just... Like put digital makeup. Your face? Yeah, basically. like digital, right, you know right. what I'm saying? So it's, it's that we use both. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's just say that I have somebody that uh, needs a gunshot wound. Mm-hmm. They need for me to make, <clears throat> they can show, use the, the CGI and right. the special effects to show the blood splatter when it first happens. Okay. Right? But after after that, <laughs> let's just say that um, after you've seen the splatter happen, you want to do a close up, you need to still see the wound. Right, right, right. right. Okay. So then I'll come and I'll do the wound On a that's there yeah. and do the close up stuff. 
Gotcha. Um, or sometimes they want to see the blood running or um, things of that nature. Then you also have the live performances. So it's funny. People ask me, well, when are your busy season? Everybody knows October because it's, you know, Halloween. Yeah. But what they don't think about is I live in the South. The Bible Belt. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs their Jesus is crucified. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> the passion so, of the, the Christ. The passion right? of the Christ, and they want it live. Yeah. Which is a huge experience to see it live. Mm. So um, that's my other business. In that, you can't use CGI because it's right. live. Right. So both. Do you that's feel that way. when people see it live, they have a different uh, perspective? Oh yeah, because because it, it's one thing to watch it on film and be like, "Oh, that's so cool how they did that." It's another thing when you're watching it and you see the way that I do it and mm-hmm. some other artists do it. You see the wounds opening and closing, like on his rib cage oh. when he's breathing. You see it; it's oh, moving with like, his oh, skin. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It's, it's moving with his skin. We create new skin, and it's moving with his body. Now is the skin made of latex or like we do that or we can use scar wax, either one. Scar wax. Scar okay. Wax. So y'all one. evolved from because latex, a lot of people have That's many crazy. allergies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Now I like for for television, okay. I like to use the uh the scar wax, but for for live production, I prefer the latex. Why not? Be- why why do you prefer the latex? For- because you want you want your audience that's sitting out there at the live show to get the same experience mm. that um, you get in television. And in television, you have to make everything flush perfectly to the skin mm. so that it just looks seamless and natural. Mm. Versus with the latex, I can make the wounds a little bit bigger and larger so that from the back of the audience, you can see it just like you would if you were watching the film and it was up close. Mm. So I make it a little bit more dramatic, a little bit more detailed. Um, that's a that lot way. of work. I was saying, just just listening to you, especially for makeup artists, man. Because you think about, I know we've done short films and stuff like that, and a lot we have a lot of cuts, this and that. We didn't really have we have a, we had a makeup artist on deck, but like mm-hmm. not like what what you're doing. But I'm right. just imagining so many cuts and breaks because I'm pretty sure you have. To, I'm pretty sure you've done things where you show where maybe the 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 the, the wound is healing over time or something, or yes. you know what yes. I mean. So oh, we got to get close up to that. Take the take the old one off. And now we got to put the healing one on and stuff. Like, I can imagine you just being on the... Yep. Yeah, so let me ask you something, though. Go ahead. So, when you go out in the real world and look at people, Mm -hmm. do they inspire the way you provide, the way you uh, place makeup on people? Because certain scars, that's what I'm saying. Like, his mind is going to be different. (laughs) I learned that from my chiropractor. It's funny. The story is is that she says, I go on a, uh, I go in the park, I sit on a park bench and I watch people walk. Hmm. And mm-hmm. she says, he walks, yeah, he leans this way. He says, ah, he leans to the right. He needs to be adjusted like this. I said, why do you do that? She says, I don't know. It's like a habit. Hmm. It's like with nurses' veins, mm-hmm. like yes. certain my things. Yes, sister's a nurse. She yes. picked out all my veins. <laughs> See, right, right, right. And for you, because social media has made everybody insecure, it mm-hmm. seems like, you know? I agree. You agree with that, right? Yeah. And to me, in your head, are you like processing filters as a makeup artist? Like when you look at somebody, it's like, I can make you. Yes, because you can look at certain bone structures on people. Right. And you know what they're going to look like or what you could do with their face. So someone who has a chiseled face, like a man that she's got a, you know, a man that's got a good cheek bone structure mm-hmm. and chiseled face, you can make them look a lot crazier, a lot cooler. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's just a lot you can do with them. Versus a round face, it's it's a little bit more work. Yeah. Oh, right, but right, you can right. show like the cheekbones and you can do shadowing. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and then sometimes too, like I have a a friend of mine who introduced me to a friend that is an actor mm. and he's bald. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can cut the back of his head open. <laughs> really? That's how you do this. <laughs> so, what would you do with him? Yeah, huh? I could take his head and I could split. It. Like he could, be, like you could be looking at him, his yeah. face, and just see a regular face. But then you turn around the back, it looks like his whole head is split open. 
And so, um, and that's the benefit of being bald. Like it's just easier. You ain't got to cut my like, hair because you don't have to cut the hair. You don't have to like. I feel you. So yeah, like, and I did have an actor one time. Has he still to this day has a ton of hair, mm-hmm. but he shaved off half of his hair, and we cut his um, skull open and then uh, burned half of his head and his face um, every single night for about two weeks. And uh, for live performance, but yeah, but you know he's got to go back and shave his hair, you know, all the time. every few days. And mm. but like if somebody's already bald, it's just good clean skin. You can just go ahead and go in there, and it's just easy stuff. That's a good comeback to do. for that. I like that positive outtake on that. It's already cut. It's already clean. You feel but I'm gonna put a hole in your head. We go, but you yeah. gotta put a hole in your head though. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So let's let's move on from that, man. I, I love these stories, man. Me and you could just talk all day about that. Like I love <laughs> horror films. So that right there, mm-hmm. we we can go back and forth on that one. I love it. I love it. So let's talk about like. Your role as a friend, Chai Z, at the Apex. Like, what sure. is Apex? So, Apex is a it's a leadership fundraising company <laughs> um, that has a focus on health, and they go into schools and they teach kids about leadership mm. and about really just about controlling, you know, your environment and being positive towards yourself and to others. Gotcha. And then they also uh, have a fundraising component to it, which is a fun run. So the entire time that kids are learning about leadership and uh, they're also doing exercise leading up to it. So all of the people that you hire are athletes in some shape, form, or fashion. Okay. They're either athletes or former athletes, but they also learn about leadership so they can go in and use what they've done in leadership and sports to also teach leadership skills um, to the students that they work with. And at the end, yeah, we have a big fundraiser um, and we raise money through running mm. and um, sports, you know, right. you being athletic and being active. And so, yeah. How do they utilize like your your background, your entertainment background or just your overall business background, special effects, makeup background? How do they use that to their advantage? So I, I don't, I no longer do it, but when I did it though, mm-hmm. when I had that company though, our opening ceremony, uh, I'm a former gymnast, as you know, I said Dang. earlier. So I used to bring in a trampoline mm-hmm. and that was my intro. I ran in and I did a flip off of it and I would land, which my mom was like, are you sure at this age? I'm like, Jackie Chan. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Jackie Chan. <laughs> I was like, we're holding on to it as long as we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I, ran, <laughs> so I ran in and I would do my flip yeah. off the trampoline uh-huh. and uh, the other athletes would come in and we had the lights and the music and... Uh, sometimes we may have like smoke machine just mm-hmm. so it was it was a it was a whole show really just getting the kids amped up about what was about to take place over the next yeah. two weeks. Wow. That's dope, man. It's kinda like their own Olympic games at that time or something. Yeah. Yeah. So they say though, schools in the US they raise what, eight hundred million annually through fundraising events. hmm I didn't know that. With a fifteen percent increase in tech based fundraisers. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about technology, like how do you, how does Apex play into technology? So each kid, we had an app. Mm-hmm. We had an app and then we had a website. And each kid was given a code. Mm. And that a code allowed them to have access to their quote-unquote back office. If you've ever done multi-level marketing before, mm-hmm. you know that every person is given a back office to the uh, to the website. And that's exactly what we did with the kids. They had access to their own website. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And the parents as well. And through that, they could just plug in telephone numbers or email addresses and they could send out things. So in the past, your fundraising was basically confined to who was in your community. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, you got everybody competing for the same people Mm -hmm. versus technology allows you, if your grandmother in Mexico or the Dominican Republic or Nigeria or whatever wants to donate towards your, Mm -hmm. your cause, she can do it. Mm-hmm. From the other side of the globe, right. it gotcha. allows you to go global and raising money for your school, versus mm-hmm. just working on your own, you know, little community. Right, right, right. right. Knocking on the right. same doors, and you know, mm-hmm. yeah, selling chocolate. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And and, yeah. and really, the the rule the rule in fundraising is this: the person who gets to you first mm. to pull your heartstrings wins. Yeah, <laughs> didn't know that. 
Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah. that's why so, any, anybody that is not utilizing, like if you do a fundraising activity and it's a live auction thing, that's one thing. That's, that's the people that are in that room. It may be a targeted audience, mm-hmm. but if you're doing something that is not a one night, just targeted audiences for anybody that wants to donate money, if you're not utilizing um, technology, someone will get to you before someone else that you know. Yeah. And so then by the time that this other person that you may be closer to gets to you, mm-hmm. you're like, well, I already donated. Yeah. Wow. Because somebody used their technology. That's why things like um, GoFundMe are so big. Mm-hmm. Um, anything that uses the technology. Wow. It's, it's, that right there mm-hmm. reminds me of like a modernized version of the Cold War. The war of technology. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, how can I get to this person first before he gets to his, this person? And it's crazy because hmm. technology plays a big part in our life. Yeah. You know, yeah. when it comes to communication. Yeah. But like, I still see people selling chocolates, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, outside of Walmart. Mm-hmm. And girls selling Girl Scout cookies, mm-hmm. which you have a story, like you told us off camera. Like, mm-hmm. please share that. Like, Well, the Girl Scouts, they've upped their game. The Girl Scouts mm-hmm. have figured this out. So mm-hmm. my niece, she was a first year Girl Scout. She sold cookies. Mm-hmm. Okay. She did, I think over, it was, it was well over $4,000 worth of cookies that she sold. Yeah. Okay. And what she did was, uh, first off, stories sell facts. No, facts tell story sell. So if you just say, hey, I'm selling cookies, help me out, that's just telling. Yeah, yeah. She, not even knowing, not even meaning to do anything, she mm-hmm. made a video, and she loves feeding the homeless. She feeds mm-hmm. the homeless every Tuesday with my parents. Nice. And she said, buy my cookies, she said, either for you, mm-hmm. or I'm going to give cookies, a box of cookies to every homeless person mm-hmm. that I mm, what a way feed to, food. Yeah, yeah. What a way to pull that so she, like, yeah. so she <laughs> did that, and people just started nice. from... All over the country. <clears throat> yeah. She uh her parents posted the video. I reposted the video on my social media. And the Girl Scouts have links now mm-hmm. where you can just click on the link and go from anywhere in the account. world, That's go so. straight to their account. Yeah. And you can order whatever cookies you want. And then you can say where you want the cookie shipped to. Oh, and so like man. they have just, you know, upped their game. And mm-hmm. to add what my niece did as well, it just shows that. It works. It was like the perfect blend of using technology, mm-hmm. um, business strategy as far as like telling your story and your why, sharing your why, why you do what you do. Yeah. And then that person to person, which was, you know, when we shared it, what she said, yeah. how people got involved. And I mean, like it just So what what do you think what are the what do you think the pros and cons? Because I'm listening because you were talking about, in some cases, you know, you you may have tried to sell some cookies and stuff like that to somebody that may already bought some. You know, you're knocking on the door, but then they done got it online. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Now, mm-hmm. being that, I always call, like, being online and stuff like that, it's, it's like a gift and a curse. Because mm-hmm. when everybody starts doing it then, that whole social media marketing thing, it's like, yeah, I mean, your outreach would be pretty good. But now you have to really kind of, like, see you have to knuckle down like on the on the demographics of the, or, or a case because you could run across the same advertisement to sell some cookies as somebody else was doing it like what's the you know do you feel like it's going to be saturated after a while once they once they learn that method how to advertise that way well, yeah, with that method your why the person with the what best why always wins that's true so it's just the best so it's just yeah. survival of the fittest on that part yeah it's it's it's, it's the same way it's the same reason why Publix costs more money to shop at than Kroger's or Walmart, mm-hmm. but people will go to a Publix because of the way that they greet you. That is true. That's a fact. You cus- story there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put yeah. that out there. Put that out there. I love that, that, that job, man. Shout yeah. out to Publix, man. Y'all treat me good, man. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. right. The, pub- the public service or even a Chick-fil-A, they don't have a dollar menu. But people love to go to Chick Fil A. I never thought about that because of the way that they. I never thought about going to Chick Fil A seeking a dollar menu. Oh yeah, no, that's crazy. It it is right. You will pay right. What you owe there? Like yeah, exactly. You're gonna pay. You're fine with that. It'll be eleven ninety nine for for a three piece tender. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) and you're you're completely okay. But the the way that they sell their why, which is customer service, right, Mm -hmm. and making sure that you feel valued, have a small VIP experience, 
um, when you go there Thanks. unintentionally, just the way that they always yeah. treat you. Right. And it's it could be the same little teenager that just cussed somebody out mm-hmm. in class, but they got a job there. Hi, welcome. Oh, yeah, different. Yeah, so I know who you really yeah. are. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because they train their people how to treat their customers. Customers, right. And so, like, when you're online, if you sell your why, um, even when I sell my jewelry, I could probably count on both hands how many times I've actually put a price. I tell the story behind the piece. Mm-hmm. People connect emotionally, <laughs> and then they purchase. That's see, what happens online. See, and here's the, they, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, the fundraisers, GoFundMe, and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, so let me ask you, like, when it comes to like today's time, I feel a lot of us today mm-hmm. lack customer service. And it's it's people seek out that nowadays. Mm-hmm. You go to Publix and you go to Chick Fil A, right? Right. And to me, I love their training methods. Now I don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Okay, I don't know if we're doing jumping jacks, going through boot camp. I don't know any <laughs> of that. But all I know is that they're training their people to function and create value for themselves in today's society mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. we lack customer service. I like for real, like you know, you got Kroger's, you got Publix. I go to Kroger's because it's close. Yeah, but Publix has a cleaner environment. Like I don't know when I go in there, I just, I just want to sniff the air. And you, mm-hmm. you, and you actually and, and, don't right. mind using the bathroom there. Oh yeah, them bathrooms are clean. <laughs> sit I down. ain't never been to a dirty Publix bathroom. <laughs> yeah, Kroger's, you know, yeah, you know, you it's a hit or miss. Yeah, you know, it's a hit or miss. But literally, like literally, let's let's okay, that's cool, man. So let's talk about like since we're on the whole cultural aspect and uh, you know, breaking boundaries and things. Uh, I'm gonna skip down to like let's talk about your experience with Miss Africa. Okay. Like, like, what was your most memorable experience serving as an ambassador for Miss Africa USA? And I didn't know you could do that. I didn't right. Know that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how did it contribute to your professional and personal growth? Okay, sure. So <clears throat> what happened was um, Kathy Anwu, mm-hmm. uh, for anyone that's local in this area, you probably know who Kathy is. Um, she, we grew up together mm-hmm. a little bit and then kind of reconnected. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember her as a little girl. Then I saw her as a woman. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, mm-hmm. whoa! Yeah. Like she right, was right, right. like, like, yeah. like strong, yeah, gorgeous, yes. yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. She's gorgeous. If you've ever seen her before, and so she became this a Miss Nigeria, and then this Miss Nigeria to the USA. So every country in Africa has their their beauty queen, mm-hmm. and then every on the state side. They ha- that country has a beauty queen that represents uh, that country plus the USA, and their goal is to be able to merge okay. uh, and bring <clears throat> unity from their citizens that live on this side of the pond and those that live on this side. Gotcha. And then they have a Miss Africa for the continent, and then they have like a Miss Africa um, to the United States. Okay. So her family background is she's Nigerian. Got gotcha. you. And uh, she became Miss Nigeria to the USA, and then she became. Uh, Miss Africa to the USA. She won that competition as well. And so we had a uh, a conversation and we were just sitting there talking and I realized, I was like, well, who does your, your PR? Mm-hmm. And she was like, oh, I don't have anybody. Mm-hmm. And she had a very, very, very strong platform. Her platform was for uh, women's health because her mother died while she was in college um, mm-hmm. from breast cancer. And then women's education. Uh, Kathy's a very educated woman. And she believes in that and wants to make sure that, you know, anybody, but especially, you know, females, um, gets a good education, which in Africa, no matter where you are, you have to pay for your education, even in the public school system. Mm -hmm. The parents have to pay. Mm -hmm. So every public school is basically like getting a private school education in a way. Um, And so that was her platform. So I used to be a spokesperson for the Boy Scouts of America when I was a kid, like my late teens, going into my early 20s. Mm -hmm. So I was accustomed to, you know, working with celebrities and being in the spotlight and television interviews. And we always had a PR lady there who would coach me and tell me, you say this, you don't say this. You look at the camera this way, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, I know how to do it. Yeah. Right. I said, so I said, do you want me to do that for you? And she was like, yes. And so she was like, you just be my ambassador. So that's what... <laughs> you use your acting so, experience. Yeah, yeah. And you use my mm-hmm. acting experience and my experience as, as a spokesperson uh, to help her. And so I started like booking uh, appointments for her 
And then I would be there and say, okay, we're going to say this. We're not going to say this. Yeah. Uh, some stuff happened in Nigeria. I can't remember exactly what it was. Some type of drama they had going on. Mm-hmm. And so I just call and call News Channel 5 mm-hmm. and all the other stations like, hey, this is making the headline. Did you know that Miss Nigeria USA or Miss Africa USA, that she lives here? And they mm-hmm. were like, oh. So, you know, they interviewed her and I found a location, uh, public appearances. Uh, and still to this day, um, my parents and their church, uh, shout out to Bethel, mm-hmm. um, Missionary Baptist Church, they still support financially to help kids go to school. Okay. okay. That's what I'm talking so about. So yeah, yeah. it was this many years later, and the work is still being done, and Kathy's still a nurse. Yeah. Um, so, and she's still using her platform. See, and I like so. how it's for, <clears throat> although she wants to help the black community, mm-hmm. she's focused on more black women, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's okay mm-hmm. because I, you know, I usually have these talks with people like, it's okay for us to have barbershop, mm-hmm. and it's okay for them to have beauty salons, mm-hmm. right? Just to mm-hmm. talk and <clears throat> right. you know relate to amongst themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I've always felt that like sometimes we're pressured to work together. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We'll come together. Like if he's hosting an event, that's mm-hmm. where we come together. It's like with Josh Correct. from Clean Cut Conversation, yeah, yeah, yeah. a doctor from this this person, right? Yeah. So he knows that he's getting. Two perspectives, strong perspectives. You know, like to me, I feel like sometimes when we, I love to unite each other, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes I feel that we can get lost in our own values too. Mm -hmm. And we start creating conflict. And sometimes it's like, just go start your own. And I respect that. She Mm -hmm. she helps us, Mm -hmm. but her main target is women. You know, but Mm -hmm. helping black women is helping black men too. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. We all work together. And that's what I'm right. Like, father roles, it's Mm -hmm. important. I do think it's important for a father to be in, especially a boy's life, you know, and vice versa, a daughter and a mother. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Vice versa. Uh, That balance, you know, that structure. But like, yeah, man, just building up her women Mm -hmm. that she, to me, puts me at ease. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As a male, I'm like, shoot, I like the way she thinks, man. I might have to go over and check, you know, right. because mm-hmm. their ideals match up with mine. And that's why we created this podcast is mm-hmm. because of that type of concept. Like, we bring on black males, empowering black males, mm-hmm. you know. And sometimes, like, I want the feeling when you watch this show mm-hmm. to feel like you watch Blank, Black Panther for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> right. you said everybody was working. Yeah, everybody came and yeah. we were like, yeah, that's us. Yeah. That's us. That's that's what we could be. Yeah, that's yeah. what we are, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I love, like, how you stepped in her realm. You know what I'm saying? And you still empowered her. But then I think you empowered us, too. Right. I, right, I felt right. that. That story is like you found value in what she needed. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, you are valuable. And even though I'm going helping women, like, look, like, I'm going to have a man do this for me. Because mm-hmm. you would think that it would be all women. Helping women PR and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. you really like supported her cause, and like I said, I appreciate you for that. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. for real, we need that. And like <clears throat> him, you're a youth leader too, kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah see, yeah. and all that, man. Like, so like, let's talk about that. Like the challenges, like of you being youth leader and being involved in the community. Mm-hmm. Like, what are the challenges that you have faced when trying to do community work? And how do you utilize those experiences to inspire and motivate others? Because it said over 50% of community leaders report facing significant obstacles in their efforts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, such as funding and an engagement mm-hmm. and resilience. Mm-hmm. She didn't, she didn't, she wasn't resilient against you working for her. But did you, I know you brought, how can I say, Roy? It's like you brought the opportunity to her mm-hmm. and was she hesitant at first like no she was not hesitant at all she was not hesitant at all um there were supposed to be some other people that were assisting her Ooh. and um uh, they just didn't come through oh my and no. so she was just like i put in all this work mm-hmm. because i have a platform i didn't do it just to be pretty yeah yeah thank you and just to model and just to be known Gotcha. She had a real platform. Yeah. And so she needed to get her her message out there. Mm-hmm. And so it just opened up a door. You know, I was working with kids at the time. I had just, well, still, yeah, I was working with youth at the time. And then I had, you know, 
my background as a as a performer and an entertainer, and then you know I had been the uh, spokesperson for the Boy Scouts, was familiar with the PR. Gotcha. I knew how to call people, make those calls to open doors. So, and we had a relationship with each other from childhood. Mm-hmm. So it just clicked and it worked, and we and, and and I was just like, hey, why not help? Mm-hmm. And we just made it happen with or without those people. Finance. Um, that was just both of our our mindset was so let's you're not going to do what you're supposed together. to do. Yeah. We're just going to do it regardless. And mm. I had to ask is ask this, excuse me, mm-hmm. but were they women? Some of them were. So it's I would it's like okay, you had this scenario. I'm I'm gonna throw this scenario. Yeah, like yeah. he threw an event right mm-hmm. Juneteenth. Right, his Personal problem event. was is that he didn't get support from his own people. Right, financial support from Black people, you know, because mm-hmm. it's Juneteenth, you know. <clears throat> and let me ask you, bro, did mm-hmm. you feel some type of way when white oh. people? Like, I'm just, I know I did. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I felt some type of way when when the Caucasians were. Um, I, I was, I was, I was accepting of their, of their, of their, of their generosity. Okay, you know what I'm saying? They're very generous. You know what I mean? But I also, it was like a, it was almost like a. You know, I was caught between the middle because I'm like, I would really love this from my black community to, you know, to pitch mm-hmm. in because it's not being city funded. This is grassroots. Like I was like telling them a little bit behind camera, like grassroots money that was coming out of our pockets. Go ahead. But we saw Caucasians that were contributing most of the time without even being asked or after we present what we need. It's just like, sure. You know what I mean? And it just it just kind of put me in a place like, well, why can't we do that as as black people, you know. So you, but you, you went on with the program. I went on with it, but you still felt felt like, weird. Like, dang, like man, this like, is right. funded You're by right. the majority of people that are not even in my culture, right? And hers right. were she, women, mm-hmm. women platform, right. women get together. But then it's like, I guess I gotta, I just gotta get it done. Mm-hmm. It comes to the point right. where you kind of break your morals and break your foundation. I don't even say you have to break your morals. I just think you get to the point where it's just like your why becomes stronger than your obstacles. And it's just like, I have to figure out how to do this and how to make this happen. And I, I did it all the time as a teacher. You know, mm-hmm. um, I did it when I wor- I was a counselor one time for juveniles. I used to have to do it all the time. I always had to just figure out how to make this possible and how to... Uh, Let's let's move forward. Let's mm. just let's just let's just go ahead and um, let's move forward. I, I can even think about you know I was telling him right, right. that I had figured out. I was kept telling people I'm going to use gemstones one day as a way to generate funds mm. for worthy causes. Yeah. And I remember someone, a multimillionaire, telling me, "Ah, oh, well, just <laughs> let me know when that happens." Blah 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 blah. By the time that I told him, he didn't know that I'd already done it. Got gotcha, you. Mm. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. One time, but that's all it takes. Yeah, yeah that's all it takes. <laughs> that's all it takes time. is one time to know that you can continue to do it. Um, and so sometimes those challenges become the fire mm-hmm. that kind of get you going um, to to keep going and keep you know it's, it's your motivation sometimes mm. um, to go ahead and to do something. But yeah, it can be a little bit um, disappointing, especially if your your challenge is coming from the inside circle, yeah. not the outside. You expect right. sometimes the outside circle, <clears throat> but when it's your inside circle, that's when it gets to be a little bit frustrating. Very frustrating. Man, yeah. so man, let's go ahead and wrap this up. So like, we've discussed topics like creative pursuits and your special effects. We've mm-hmm. talked about the jewelry business, uh, community support through Apex, and apparently the importance of multicultural engagement, you know, like using technology, and not using technology, just using good old customer service. Correct. Answering the whys, or using the why method, I say the why mm-hmm. technique, to sell yourself to mm-hmm. others so you can be more involved and more engaged with others. Mm-hmm. You know? Because you got to, everybody has to have a selling point. Yeah, yeah. They have to. Yeah, yeah. You, mm-hmm. you, when you go out in that world, you have to sell. You have to mm-hmm. sell yourself. You have to sell your brand. Mm-hmm. And you have to understand that you have to convince mm-hmm. people to not only fund you, but to be honest, to like you. Yeah. And it, it's crazy. It's, you know, it's like putting on a show. But those are the, ca- you know, key points we discussed today. But, like, let me ask you, like, to conclude all of this, like, how how would you conclude it? And what would you tell an upcoming entrepreneur? I would say to any entrepreneur that's out there, you have to understand that failure is a part of the plan. Like, you're going to mess up. 
And that's one thing that I didn't understand. I did not know that in the beginning. But once you get into a room full of what you would consider extremely successful people, they've made their millions. And they, you know, you, your your yearly dream is their monthly income. Um, they will tell you that it, it's a part of it. And it is a normal part of it. And you just have to work through it. You, have, you can either learn from it or you can quit. Um, and this is just mandatory. The other thing that I'm going to say too is, you know, like we're all given, um, God gifts, God given gifts and talents. You can either be who you were created to be, or you can try to be somebody else. And, and it's not going to work in your favor as well to be, um, somebody else. I'm going to also let you know that when you get ready to start, um, people will not understand you. And the majority of those people who don't understand you will be people who you are closest to. Mm-hmm. Because how people meet you and what light in which they meet you in mm-hmm. is typically the only way that they see you. Um, just like <laughs> me fair. being a, a, a teacher, you know, and then going into the movie industry and doing models. I never showed my chest in the classroom. Mm. Mm. <laughs> no, right, right, right. I, don't yeah. I didn't. I didn't wear rhinestone shoes, and yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> and all that stuff. People were like, "Whoa, you know." Yeah, and right, right, now right. they're used to it, right? But making that transition or whatever, um, people in your your first circle, or even going into you know the jewelry industry, they were okay. We 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 know you do bones and mm-hmm. traditional work, but diamonds, you know, like that was a huge thing. So, but you will find that you do have a support system. You just have to leave the room that you're standing in mm-hmm. and go to another room, mm-hmm. and there'll be people that you don't even know, and they will sometimes jump on board faster than the people that you know. Hey. Um, and so you just can't, you can't up and quit, uh, just get into another room, just get into another room and it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to want to leave, but you have to make that your new normal. Oh, that's real. I don't have nothing to say to that. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. I mean, no, nah, just to repeat on that. It's just like, hey, they, it's going to be uncomfortable. That's it. That's it. And what you said, you, 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 you said about, you know, failure, you might as well. You know, it, it, it be ready for that. Because a lot of us, you know, especially in our culture, we we want to see things done overnight. You know, like, mm-hmm. man, I want this right now. You know, only thing that might be overnight is, you know, betting on FanDuel. That's about it. You know, you might get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but in real life, no, that's real talk, man. You know, that hits hard, too, because, uh, you know, just experiencing that myself of being frustrated with the failures, but then really the way that I'm overcoming that is at accepting it. Because I wasn't accepting it before. I was just like, mm. man, dang, I messed up again, man. I quit. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right, right, No, we appreciate that message, man. We appreciate you coming here. Real talk. Yeah, man. And for me, like, failure is an option for me. Mm-hmm. That's and when, real. And when I mean to say that, like, <clears throat> when I was going through my weight loss journey and workout journey, like, I mm-hmm. didn't realize when you go into the gym, I think I've seen you in the gym. Mm-hmm. Like, Ghost. We right, 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 right. <laughs> Technically, when you go work out, you are breaking down yourself to failure. If you want results, you almost have to go to failure. Yeah, and it's it's crazy. And I utilize that mindset in my business. Is because you have to push, you have to push that 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 band, that rubber band. Sometimes it looks like it's getting white a little bit as you stretch yeah, it. Right, right, right. But sometimes it may pop. But then it may not. Mm-hmm. But the key is, after you push yourself from that point on, it feels like you have reached a new level. Mm-hmm. I feel mm-hmm. like Goku off of Dragon Ball. You see how he gets beat up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next thing you know, a Saiyan gets stronger after he gets yeah, beat, out, beat up within an inch of his life. True. Mm-hmm. And I feel that with, when it comes to business, you have to put your all out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then if you fail, you just all you could do is backtrack and say, all right. I've already went as far as I could in that direction. Mm-hmm. Let's move to another room. Mm-hmm. You actually have more confidence going into that room because it's like, well, yeah. I can only fall as you know, far as the floor. Yeah. Right, right, right. Just yeah, like you know Mario what I'm saying? Games, Nintendo, yeah. Super right. Mario, yeah. them level. You said something about the rubber band. That's cool. The more you stretch that rubber band, right, you change the shape of it because you kept pulling, you kept stretching, you kept stretching, going... It, Trying to get to that limit. Yeah. If you don't put, if you don't mess with the rubber band enough, it's gonna stay in that same shape. So that white spot you're talking about is really pro- progress. 
it's it's not as hard to stretch that uh that that rubber band anymore because you've already pulled through it, you know. So, mm. and this is yeah. man, this made me want to use the bathroom, man. Don't sure. <laughs> use the bathroom on yeah. this couch. <laughs> 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 got, got me riled up. In, in gymnastics, they used to celebrate. Yeah. Um, when I was being trained, not when I was a trainer, but when I was being trained, they used to celebrate your pain. And I remember the first time, I didn't know what a rip was, but mm-hmm. when you're doing the bars, your hands, um, sometimes you will rip literally about an inch or two inches of your skin mm-hmm. off. And the first time it happened, I'm out there hollering, mm-hmm. trying not to cuss, mm-hmm. and <laughs> and like... I'm in pain. And my coach in the whole gym was screaming and yelling, Marcus got his first rip. Yeah. And the cloud was just like, what? And then I learned that the pain was a part of the process mm-hmm. in gymnastics. And and every time that somebody got a new rip, the whole gym mm. cheered, stopped and cheered. Well, <laughs> speaking of ripping, we're about to rip ourselves out of here. <laughs> Let's get it. Mm-hmm. Let's get it, man. Thank you all for enjoying the show. You know, Clean Cut Conversations, the podcast for exceptional Southern black men. I'm your host, Josh Lovett, with my co-host. James Royce, Max, and Gill. And we thank our special guest, Mr. Marcus Lucas, the second, right? The second. The, the second. second. <laughs> well, thank you for coming in here, and we are out. Thank you all. Oh, good.